problem that I'd like to discuss this evening is something that has bothered me ever since my first philosophy class. When we were studying the concept of telos or end, um, and this is something that perhaps people are familiar with already, <coughs> but just, just to clarify the concept, um, the notion of something having an end or a telos refers to it's having some sort of goal or it's existing for the sake of something. And the telos of a thing is something that completes it or perfects it, that is its good, what it is for. Um, and so naturally, you know, being introduced to this concept for the first time, uh, my classmates and I were sort of going around the world picking out objects and trying to figure out what their telos was, and we came up with a chicken, and we wondered what on earth the telos of a chicken might be. And of course, the, the happy idea occurred to us that probably the telos of the chicken was to exist in a bowl of chicken soup as its sort of completion. Um, so I remember we made quite a lot of jokes about the happy chicken, you know, now it's part of the soup and it's, it's fulfilled and it's completed as part of the soup. Um, but then we were sort of disabused of this notion by our philosophy professor who pointed out that this is not in fact the way that the concept of telos functions. In fact, the, the chicken exists for its own sake. <coughs> and what a chicken is for is to live the life of a chicken well. So existing as part of the soup can't be something that completes the chicken as such, because then that would mean that we have a, a, all sorts of unfulfilled chickens running around that are imperfect and incomplete until they finally land in their perfected state as part of a bowl of soup. And that doesn't seem to do justice to the nature and integrity of a chicken. So a chicken exists for its own sake. What it is for is to do chicken things and do them well, pecking uh, insects and running around and reproducing and generally doing whatever it is that are typical chicken functions. Um, but this, this, uh, this solution didn't set, set quite right with me either, <coughs> because it seemed to me that, then what about the bowl of soup? Because if the chicken exists for its own sake, then it seems as though if we divert the chicken into a bowl of soup, then we don't, the, the chicken somehow fails to reach its end. What justifies our sort of coming in and snatching the existence that is good in itself of a chicken away from the chicken and reappropriating it as a bowl of soup. And this is a familiar thing when we're talking about sentient creatures, of course, but the same problem occurs if we talk about um, really anything that we make. We might ask ourselves, <coughs> um, for, for instance, if, if we have a tree, that's not a problem of you know, ending the life of a sentient being or questions of causing suffering, but if a tree's tea loss is to exist and grow and become mature and achieve the perfection of the tree, um, then how can we justify making it into this beautiful violin, right? But if not, right, um, it, it seems as though that we can't, in fact, have any violins. So it seems as though, in that case, and this is a great puzzle, um, one possibility is that we think of the natural world as something that's fundamentally imperfect until it's perfected by our, um, our, our creative activities. So the chicken and the tree are just sort of raw materials sitting there waiting to be perfected as human artistic products as the soup or the violin, which seems insufficiently respectful to the integrity of these natural products. <coughs> the other option, it seems, is that chickens and trees are perfected all by themselves and that our creative activities, therefore, constitute some kind of violent or aggressive act in the world that is perfectly fine and beautifully perfect without us. Um, now, these, these two options are rather, uh, neither, both, both of them seem to have um, problems associated with them. And what I want to suggest is that <coughs> Thomas Aquinas gives us a sort of alternative way of thinking about the relationship between the natural world and our creative or our human artistic um, activities that offers a kind of middle way between them. And the question I therefore want to pose is familiar, oops, as the question of whether art perfects nature. Here of a woodcut of um, Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene in the guise of a gardener. Um, and the way we're going to use the term art this evening 
is to refer to the whole realm of human creativity, so not just the fine arts, but any, any activity in which human beings bring into existence something new. Um, and nature we'll understand as referring to anything that's discovered by us and not made by us. Right? So the question of whether art perfects nature. Um, <coughs> and so what I want to do tonight is to think about first two cultural influences that shape the way that we think about these, um, think about this problem that come to us from the early moderns and from the Romantic era. And then I want to talk um, at some length about how Aquinas offers us a way of resolving some of these tensions by reflecting particularly on his account of uh, the human being or the human artist as being made in the image of God as a divine artist. That therefore sort of sets a standard for how we can think of ethically our responsibilities toward the natural environment around us. <coughs> Now, I, I also realize that it's a little bit unusual, perhaps, to introduce a Christian medieval thinker into the contemporary discussion of environmental ethics. Um, on the one hand, one usually finds Aquinas um, lumped together with thinkers that we'll, we'll see later on, connected with the, with the early modern era, um, as uh, putting the human being at the top of the ontological uh, created universe. Um, and saying that all of, all of creation is ordered toward the human being. And the worry is that this is a kind of devaluing of non-human creatures. Um, <coughs> so he's generally sort of understood to have this, this view that's seen as very deeply problematic in, in, in contemporary environmental ethics. Um, but it's also interesting that uh, Christian thinkers, generally speaking, sometimes get the opposite criticism from particularly in the bio, uh, bioengineering or genetic engineering type literature. Um, so for instance, a, an article by, uh, from 2006 by Ronald Bailey speaks about, <coughs> excuse me, um, speaks about um, a group of what he calls bioconservatives who uh, want to stop the progress of medical technology in order to protect their, what he calls their cramped and limited view of human nature, right, out of a fear of playing God. So the sort of worry is, does this sort of classical Christian perspective on the relationship of human beings to nature require us to think of natural beings as sort of just our playthings that we can control, right, or does it require us to think of natural beings as something that's perfect in every way and not to be touched? Right? And I think Aquinas doesn't actually, he's been tarred in some way with both views, but he doesn't hold either of them um, as is. Okay. So we might ask then, oh, and here's Aquinas. I imagine everyone knows who he looks like. Right. There he is. All right, so are we masters, parasites, or something else vis-a-vis -vis the natural world? And one strain of cultural influence that we can, um, that, uh, that affects our thinking or shapes our reactions to um, the natural environment today traces back to influences that we can find in Francis Bacon. So if we turn back to the year 1614, um, Francis Bacon is the author of a treatise known as the New Atlantis, in which he describes a kind of scholar's paradise, where scholars are able to study the, entire, the entirety of the natural world and unlock its mysteries for the sake of improving human life. And I think one of the most interesting descriptions or revealing descriptions is the one uh, cited here, where he describes what their gardens look like. So in the voice of one of the scholars working at this paradise of scientific investigation, he says, we have also large and various orchards and gardens, wherein we do not so much respect beauty as variety of ground and soil proper for diverse trees and herbs. And we make by art in the same orchards and gardens, trees and flowers to come earlier or later than their seasons, and to come up and bear more speedily than by their natural course they do. We make them also by art much greater than their nature and their fruit greater and sweeter, and of differing taste, smell, color, figure from their nature. 
And many of them we so order is that they become of medicinal use. We have also means to make diverse plants rise by mixtures of earths without seeds, and likewise to make diverse new plants differing from the vulgar and make one tree or plant change into another. And of course here, this is Bacon's imagination, right? His hope for what science might be able to recover, and we can identify aspects of all of these things that we've in fact achieved. Um, so these dreams of his have become reality. But I think what's particularly telling about this quote is the phrase, we make them by art greater much than their nature. So things have a sort of starting point, natural things, but they're not very good. And the whole point of human beings is to improve them, to unlock their mysteries in order to figure out how they work so you can make them better. And I particularly love this wood cutting. If we um, go close up here, we can see that um, this guy at the bottom is trundling around a wheelbarrow with a strawberry in it that's as large as he is. So I don't know. It seems to me the bigger the strawberries get, the more tasteless they get. So I can sort of imagine this one probably doesn't taste like anything at all. But um, it's a nice touch. You've got this huge chicken up at the top as well. <coughs> and so again, the, the idea is that nature, it's interesting that he says this particularly about a garden, because we think of gardens as a place where we wander and we appreciate nature, right? But here, these are experimental gardens. They serve a sort of function. The things that are not there to be appreciated, they're there to be improved. Right? Um, we can also uh, find this view, for instance, in John Locke as well. If we fast forward a couple of decades to the middle of the 1600s, um, Locke describes nature apart from human labor as what he calls waste land. And the idea is that human labor is what gives value to land. So he says, for instance, <coughs> from his secretaries on government, it is labor then which puts the greatest part of value upon land, without which it would scarcely be worth anything. It is to labor that we owe the greatest part of all its useful products, the fact that the straw, bran, bread of that acre of wheat is more worth than the product of an acre of as good land which lies waste is all the effect of labor. So again, the assessment of land has to do with its value in terms of producing products that are useful to human beings. And nature is seen for Locke as a kind of wilderness that's ready to be conquered by human beings. We could go on about different examples of this, but Bacon and Locke provide a kind of snapshot of a view that's known as the mastery and dominion view of nature. Um, and for these, these authors, think about for the, the, the attitude conveyed in these texts is one in which nature is a kind of laboratory of resources, a sort of warehouse of raw materials waiting for human ingenuity to come along and perfect them. Way, to transform them beyond the sort of limited existence that they have and raise them up to something truly valuable and, and perfect. Um, and so this, this view has a kind of boundless confidence in human power, even the unlimited characteristics of human uh, knowledge and our ability to transform nature in whatever way that we choose. And it's always interesting to see these sorts of things without going overboard, but to see them um, connected to different um, artistic styles uh, or aesthetic preferences um, at the time. And so here we can see the, the formal gardens of Versailles. <coughs> and it's very much, if we think about the, the attitude towards nature that's conveyed in a garden outlook, like this is the total transformation and reappropriation of natural materials to serve a geometric vision of aesthetic, um, a, a geometric aesthetic vision. So you're not going to find trees clipped into these shapes in the wild, right? But they become sort of the perfected geometrically by human activity. And now by the uh, mid-18th century, <coughs> there's a new strain of thought that's developing um, in reaction to this view. And so we can see this already in the, in the work of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who writes about the human being in civilization as a sort of degradation of the pristine, perfect state of the human being um, in a sort of hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And he attributes the woes that human beings uh, experience to this, um, the accretions of, of damage that have been done by the use precisely of reason in this attempt to perfect our lives. 
in the realm of aesthetics, we can see uh, some, some, some sort of attitude like this. When Kant talks about how the aesthetic, the moment of aesthetic appreciation is something that's particularly and fundamentally oriented toward the appreciation of natural beauty. And so when we turn our attention to um, uh, art, sort of the fine arts, the human fine arts, and we appreciate a beautiful painting, that appreciation is sort of in a way parasitical on the kind of fundamental appreciation that, or the feeling of, of wonder uh, toward the natural world. Um, we can see this also in connection with gardening styles that were popular at the time, where now this is certainly formalized in its own way, but the look that's attempt, the looks that's preferred here is one of kind of natural carelessness. The idea is that it's supposed to look as though it just all grew like this by itself, and that would be kind of perfection. <coughs> and it's interesting to see this attitude also sort of keeping pace with the Industrial Revolution, right? It's, um, with the invention of things like the power loom, right? Um, at the same time, you have this attitude of Wordsworth wandering lonely through the clouds of daffodils. Um, you see it in Tolkien and this idea of the scouring of the Shire, the destruction of the, uh, the destruction of the natural environment by the um, by um, industry by the ad advanced industry, <coughs> or in James Fenimore Cooper with the notion of the noble savage, and in music with the kind of romanticism and tone poems evoking the natural world like Smetana's Moldau, and so this sort of tremendous admiration for the natural world and a kind of fear that our activities in the natural realm sort of fundamentally threaten it. Um, <coughs> and here's some of my favorite examples are from the Hudson River School toward the end of the 1800s, painting the dramatic scenery of um, Ameri American mountains and forest scenery. And when I first saw these pictures, everybody in the, in the 80s had, uh, anybody over the age of 70 had a knockoff of them hanging over their living room sofa. And so when I saw the originals, I realized, well, this is quite different, but I still thought there's a sort of a fairy tale. This is a fairy tale portrayal, right? Until you go out to the actual areas that are being painted, you go out to the west coast and you look at some of the stuff that's painted that's ostensibly coming from the west coast, and you realize this, this is actually the impression that it makes on you when you're there. Um, <coughs> it's more realistic than I thought. Um, another example from the similar <coughs> time period, right, and you see, again, the human, human products, human activity is decaying, right, and nature remains sort of over top of it, dwarfing, there's a little, you can't see that there's a little human being in the front, but there's just almost invisible in comparison to the splendor of nature. Okay, so if we look around us now, we can see elements, I think, from both of these attitudes, in our attitudes towards the natural environment. And so we, we've inherited features of this mastery and domination view that are particularly evident when we think about medical technology, um, genetic engineering of, of foods, um, <coughs> transhumanism um, as something that people are increasingly interested in now. And there's sort of optimism about the limitless ability of human uh, of scientific investigation to improve um, human existence. So we still see some, some sort of idea of nature and a kind of raw material that we can remake to our own liking. Um, but at the same time, we also see this romantic attitude, romanticist attitude toward nature coming back in various uh, cultural strains. We see this particularly in the kinds of, of <coughs> the sort of pessimism or worry that we have about human creativity vis-a-vis -vis the natural environment. And I remember I had a conversation with a friend once about Mozart, and at the end they said, you know, Mozart is just a shabby substitute for people who don't have mountains. And I thought, there it is. It's a contemporary romanticist in some sense. Um, but also you can see this sort of thing in, in these back to nature movements that are very popular in the focus on eating organically. And, um, and the worries that we have about different ecological disasters and sort of pessimism and we, we try to do these extremely optimistic um, mastery and domination kind of activities and then they fail spectacularly and destructively and that engineers a kind of pessimism that um, pushes us in the other direction. Um, and, and faced with all of those realities, it can be easy to sort of feel as though human creativity is um, in some kind of, uh, some kind of blight or even a kind of parasite on what would otherwise be a beautiful and naturally functioning world. So a cancer, as Ted McDougall has called it. Um, <coughs> okay, so now we have these two influences that have been 
very culturally entwined today, um, and it can leave us in a kind of state of tension as to whether we should think of ourselves as having kind of mastery or as being a sort of parasite upon nature. And so we might ask ourselves what Aquinas can possibly have to say that could help us with any of these, um, uh, if it's any of these worries. Now, when we look at what Aquinas has to say, um, <coughs> we might think, well, clearly he falls into a mastery and domination kind of view. Um, this is readily assumed in the literature because Aquinas write, will write exactly that all humans are, or all creatures are ordered toward human beings. So, for instance, he says that because human beings participate the light of intellect, brute, namely non-intellectual animals, are subject to them by divine providence. Hence it is said, let us make man to our own image and likeness, namely according as he has understanding, and let him preside over the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the air and the beasts of the earth." End quote. So here, of course, Aquinas is referring to the book of Genesis, um, in which God's act of creation unfolds over six days and culminates in the of uh, the human man and woman. We have the text from the Latin Vulgate. You notice the, the subject words, subjicite, subject and dominamini, to rule over. Um, and this reference to humans occupying a special place in the rest of creation was, through the mastery and domination view, unfortunately called upon to justify a kind of power dynamic, legitimizing unrestricted manipulation of the natural environment for human benefit. This is actually, I think this is a kind of uh, pattern in the history of philosophy. You hear bad things about medieval thinkers. They were probably said by people in the Renaissance and the early modern, and people forgot where they came from, and then they get attributed to medieval thinkers. Um, so I think this is a case of that. This is actually a later view that gets read back into the similar language that shows up in medieval authors. So we notice how Locke reads this passage from Genesis, which he cites, in fact, in order to explain why human beings should go out and improve waste, these wastelands. He says, <coughs> for in fact, in Genesis, God commanded man to subdue the earth, namely, improve it for the benefit of life. And that kind of association between the sort of role that human beings have in creation and this action of mastery or dominion um, continues to the present day. So Ian McHarg, a prominent activist uh, for environmental justice, wrote in 1969, quote, in its insistence upon dominion and subjugation of nature, the biblical story of Genesis encourages the most exploitative and destructive instincts in man. Indeed, if one seeks license for those who would increase radioactivity, create canals and harbors with atomic bombs. I actually saw this. There was a proposal to do this. Um, you, know, you blow canals with atomic bombs. It would be a great way of digging them with no manpower, I guess. Um, employ po poisons without constraint or give consent to the bulldozer mentality. There could be no better sanction than this text. Here can be found the sanction and injunction to conquer nature, the enemy, the threat to Jehovah. <coughs> now, I don't think the mastery and domination uh, folks back in the early modernity thought of it, even that way in terms of an enemy or a threat. Um, certainly not what Aquinas meant, but even the sort of more moderate versions of that view are not what Aquinas has in mind when he speaks of uh, all non-human creatures as ordered toward us. So to find a solution, I think we have to look, not look away from Aquinas' view of creation, but look at it more carefully and specifically of the aspect in which God figures as a divine artist um, in his creative activity, what it means for God specifically to create something, and what specific aspect of God, human being's image, um, as components of the total order of the universe that God creates. And so what we will see is that, for Aquinas, there are certain facets of God's divine artistry that he attributes 
in a limited and restricted way to human beings as human artists um, that provide us with a kind of ethical, he doesn't cash these things out, right? Aquinas did not sit down and compose a treatise on how to respect the environment, right? But I think you can cash out the things that he says in terms of principles that can be then used to um, navigate the ethical dilemmas that are posed to us by our um, actions in the environment. <coughs> okay, so here, for instance, is God as divine artist. This is a common phrase in the Middle Ages, bringing all things into existence by number and measure. So here he's measuring the universe. Okay, so first let's get clear then on what Aquinas thinks it means for God specifically to create. And the sense in which creatures, including us, can be considered as images of God. So for Aquinas, the doctrine of creation is not intended to explain the processes by which kinds of beings such as ferns and chickens come into existence. The doctrine of creation is meant to explain why there is anything at all and not nothing. Okay, the doctrine of the dependence of all things on the source of being. And so on this account, when we say that God is the creator of the universe, what we mean is that everything, uh, what, what Aquinas means is that everything that I confuse Aquinas with myself sometimes, because I'm reading so much Aquinas all the time, I guess. Um, Everything that, uh, um, everything that we find in the natural universe derives its being in radical dependence on God. And so, <coughs> in as much as anything exists at all, it is some sort of faint likeness of the source of being. Um, so what that means is that God doesn't simply manufacture creatures. That's not what Aquinas means by thinking of God as a creator. What he does is share his being with them, right? Bring them into existence as a kind of limited reflection of himself. So Aquinas says, quote, oops, so there's the act of creating. Here's from Aquinas. Um, God, let's see, every creature imitates God as much as is possible according to its nature. And each and every creature bears a likeness of God in its existence and its nature, which gives it a certain perfection. It's a quite extraordinary claim when you think about it, right? That there's something in God that chickens are like, or that a caterpillar is like, or a pebble, right? There's something God-like about a chicken, I suppose, and there's something chicken-like about God. Um, and so what that means is that no created being fails to reflect the divine being in some way. And for Aquinas, this is what gives an ineradicable dignity and worth to the creatures that God brings into existence. Um, we can see this actually echoed really beautifully in, um, in Dante's Paradiso, where he said he, uh, Beatrice explains to Dante that uh, in the universe's resemblance of God, the higher creatures of human beings see the printed steps of that eternal worth, which is the end. So we think of creatures as a kind of footprint of the worth that is God. So they have a kind of shine or this, this value, this dignity that they have is this sort of reflection from God. Um, now what about us? Right? They might instantly want to know where we fit in this whole picture. And according to Aquinas, the human, each thing has its own absolutely unique way of imaging the creator. And the aspect of the creator that human beings image is specifically the creative activity of the creator. So if we think of the universe as a whole, as a kind of fragmented reflection of God as creator, right? The aspect of that fragmented reflection that reflects God's activity in creating is specifically the human being. That's the point of um, our existing at all uh, as part of the universe. Um, <coughs> so he says, um, 
it is necessary, or the principle of things made by art is the human intellect, which is a kind of likeness derived from the divine intellect, which is the principle of natural things. That's where we get our artistry from. It's a kind of echo of the fine artistry. And so he says, um, if the instructor of an art makes some work of art, then the student ought to pay attention to the instructor's work so that he himself might work in the likeness of the instructor. And therefore, the human intellect, which derives its intelligible light from the divine intellect, must be informed in the things it makes by careful attention to those things that occur by nature so that we might act similarly. So he gives us there, I think, a principle to apply um, when we think about our, our human activity. Perhaps we can gain some sort of insight by reflecting on the divine creative activity in order to get some proper sense of the relationship between artistry and the natural world and see if in some way it applies at the human level. This might sound like it's going to land us straight into a mastery and domination view, but I promise it's not quite going to. Um, okay. So how does Aquinas think the divine artist relates to creatures? There's two key aspects when we examine Aquinas' text closely that are particularly important. First of all, is the fact that God creates be beings that uniquely reflect his own divine being with an integrity, wholeness, and goodness of their own. And second is that God does not simply create and provide for individual creatures, but he creates them, he gives them being, keeping in mind that's the term here for create, gives them being with an eye to the goodness and the integrity of the whole. Right. So let's look at each of these one at a time. We go back to our picture here, our medieval illumination. So I'd say, first of all, what does it mean to say that God creates things with integrity and goodness of their own? And our chicken came back. Right. And they, so we can see that, as we were just saying, the, the chicken is a part of the image of the divine being that God gives to created beings. Um, and the chicken, in some sense, and we can think about this, could God have made the chicken something else? Some way. What if God had decided to make the chicken green and two feet tall with an orange flower on top? Could God have done that? And Aquinas' answer is, well, yes and no. God could make something that's green and two feet tall and has an orange flower on top, and that would be a tiger lily, right? It would be a different kind of thing. So God could make that. But he couldn't. But if he did, he would be making something different than a chicken, right? So God can't, what a chicken is, what that means is that what a chicken is, is not something that's just sort of arbitrarily dependent on the divine decision, that God can just decide from one day to the next what a chicken is, right? The chicken is a specific objective way of mirroring the divine essence, right? And if God decides that there's some sort of other being could exist to mirror him in a different way, well, he could make that, right? But a chicken is exactly the kind of reflection of God that it is. Um, and so what that means is that God's creating things is very different for many ontological reasons, but at least just focus on this one reason, um, from a child rearranging Duplo blocks, right? So my four-year-old niece, when she builds, she builds a tower out of Duplo blocks, and she doesn't like that, and she takes it apart, and she builds a house, and she takes it apart, and she can build a person, and she can do whatever she wants, right, with the, with the building blocks ad infinitum. Um, but that's not how God, as divine artist, relates to creatures. He doesn't just sort of, they're not sort of arrangements that are dependent on the divine will, right? They're concrete, objective ways of imaging God that he brings into existence and whose perfection consists precisely in reflecting God the way they do of their own uh, kind of nature. Okay. So that's going to be very important for us <coughs> when we think about environmental ethics. Now, the second, the second aspect is attending to the good of the whole. Um, and that's, uh, Aquinas says that God is not just a universal provider, 
but also a, or not just an individual provider, but also a universal provider. And so what that means is that in bringing each indi individual kind of thing into existence, God has an eye to each of them as a kind of puzzle piece that fits into the interlocking system that is the entire created universe. Right? So they're not just sort of, the universe is not a kind of collection of a random assortment of kinds. Right? Each kind somehow fits a unique slot connected to all of the other kinds in such a way as to make up some sort of complete whole that is better off for having each of those pieces in it. Um, so if we think about, for instance, the mature shade, shade of an oak tree, it's just right for sheltering certain kinds of birds, right? Or for creating the proper growing environment for certain kinds of grasses. And so each of those things is sort of part of what a tree is all about in view of the whole. And Aquinas uses this, so we can see the chicken has a place, they sort of put an arrow there, you know, it has a place in there, in the hole is the chicken place, um, <coughs> in relation to other things. Now, according to Aquinas, this is why God allows the destruction of one creature for the perfection of another. And he says, quote, Many good things would be taken away if God did not permit evil to exist, for the life of a lion would not be preserved unless the antelope were killed. So the idea here, I couldn't find an antelope, so it had to be on the page. The idea here is that the full maturity and perfection of a lion requires the eating of a horse. And that the lion is something that's a good piece in the whole system that makes up the entire universe. Um, and therefore, although it's bad for the antelope to be eaten, it's not bad for the lion to eat the antelope, right? Because lions are good and lions need to live as well. It's good for this universe, which requires both antelopes and lions. In some sense, we could also say perhaps, right, it's also good for the antelope species as a whole, that some antelopes are eaten as well, but it's certainly not good for this particular antelope, right? Now here you might say, okay, we see how this is going to go. Interspecies violence is a kind of necessary evil that God has to tolerate in order for the world to function in a harmonious whole. Um, and there I think that's not quite what Aquinas is after, in fact. Right. Um, for Aquinas, Aquinas makes a distinction between two kinds of teloi that a thing has, the primary and the secondary. Sorry, I think part of this got cut off. Um, so each thing has as its primary end to be itself well, right? So the end of a primary end of an antelope is to live the life of an antelope well. But because each thing fits into this broader puzzle, Right, of the order toward the goodness of the whole, each thing also has a secondary end which is contributing to the goodness of the whole. And now often things can fulfill their secondary end while also fulfilling their primary end, but sometimes they don't. Right? And so what's interesting about this for, for the analysis right, is that if, if we say the situation is, we ask Aquinas, so is this a kind of necessary evil that the lion has to kill the, uh, kill the antelope, right? And that the antelope fails to perform its, uh, fulfill its primary end. Um, should we think of the antelope as just sort of being cut off, right? And we sacrifice the lion, the antelope for the good of the lion. We say, well, in a way yes and in a way no, right? If we think of the antelope from its own perspective, right? It is an evil for the antelope that it cannot fulfill its primary end, right? But in relation to the secondary end, we do say that there's some way in which the antelope does fulfill secondarily its telos, right? It comes to some kind of completion and some kind of perfection when it functions in service of the broader good of the whole. Now that's not its primary end, but it is its secondary end. So it's not a complete, we can say it's not a complete loss of teleological perfection for the antelope to be uh, eaten by the lion. This is interesting and I suspect probably controversial. 
All right. But you can sort of see where we could end up going with this sort of thing. When you think about human beings. All right. So we have to be careful. Now, so what about us, then, as human beings, human artists, imaging the divine artist? Well, Aquinas reminds us that a key difference between the divine artist and the human artist is that where God is a creator, human beings are what Tolkien would call sub-creators. Right? So God brings things into existence, but human beings merely rearrange things that are already there. Right? So if you think about what it means to be creative as a human being, it means to take the thing, God's artistic products, right, and rearrange them. And that's quite a striking and perhaps terrifying kind of responsibility when we put it that way. So you may think, well, what is it could we reflect on um, that might help us sort of fulfill this responsibility appropriately and ethically? Um, so Aquinas talks about human art as mirroring divine artistry, always remembering that we do arranging and not bringing into being, and that's going to be really important for, um, for us understanding our responsibility. But he describes art relating to nature in two ways that mirror, interestingly, the two characteristics of gifts of the divine artist um, in a lesser cre cre creaturely way. So the first is to act as assistants, or he says ministers, to the natures that are already there. And there we're sort of, you can pair that with the activity of God in respecting, giving creatures a kind of dignity and completeness of their own. So God respects creatures by creating them with this kind of dignity as images of himself. Um, the second characteristic is that the human artist uses natural beings for the sake of new artistic creations with attention to the whole and for the sake of the good of the whole. This is something that finds previous to us. Um, and it's paired also with God's similar activity. So let's take a quick look at both of these. <clears throat> one of them, so the first one, is what we might describe as a kind of activity of working to improve nature with a very careful qualification. Um, for Aquinas, activities that we take up to improve things that exist by their own should be construed not as reshaping or manipulating or reformulating them, but as acting in service to the nature that's already there. So the paradigm case that he uses is the case of medicine. He says that a doctor does not, um, a, a doctor by bringing healing skills to the human being, right, does not bring some kind of additional thing that's added to the biological nature of the human body. What the doctor is doing is acting as a minister to the internal forces, biological forces of the body, seeking its own internal perfection. Right, so some sort of obstacle is holding the ailing body back from fulfilling its biological um, perfection. And what, the, and what the doctor does with the healing skills is to bring support to those internal principles. Um, another example I think that we could use for, for this would be um, the case of gardening. So if I plant a tomato plant, um, and I start weeding around it and mulching it and watering it and various things like that. In some sense, I might say I'm improving the tomato plant. It would never grow so beautifully if I weren't sort of taking such good care of it. But at the same time, if I ask myself, what am I really doing? Right, I'm ministering to the tomato plant to allow it to, from its own internal principles, to reach the fullness that it's already striving for. Um, so we see that here, here Aquinas is conceiving of human artistry as taking this kind of supportive rather than a masterful role vis-a-vis -vis, um, natural objects, which is respectful of their natural dynamism toward their own internal telos. And in this way, we image and we also respect the first characteristic of the divine artist, which is to create beings that have that internal dynamism and dignity of their own. Right. Okay, so if we think of this in practical terms, too, I might say, well, how might this kind of activity inform our, for instance, um, breeding 
a better chicken somehow, right? And I think perhaps we could, we could formulate this in terms of a deterministic principle that these kinds of activities are legitimate if the kind of, if what we can construe ourselves as lending support to the chicken to be the best chicken it can be. But if the breeding of the chicken produces a chicken that, for our purposes, can't do chicken things well, right, can't walk because it would fall forward or its legs would snap because we've bred them to be so heavy, right, then these kinds of activities are in fact contrary to the dignity and integrity of the chicken and that would be, I think, for Aquinas, um, <coughs> an illegitimate treatment of nature. All right. Okay, the second point here, however, this all sounds lovely until we consider the fact that we don't just sort of stand outside things and support them and minister to them, we also use them up, right? Um, so we use the wood of trees to create violins, or we use tomatoes to make pasta sauce, and the tomatoes no longer can achieve their natural end if they're in my pasta sauce, right? So how does Aquinas justify this kind of activity, or how should we understand it? Now, here's what he says. Those things that come into human use are ordered toward the human being as to an end which is higher, principalior, than the means, the things that we use. And here he might say, well, there we go. So he's a master in domination theorist, after all. We're just waiting for this to come up. Human beings rule the universe. It doesn't matter that things have the natural end. Our purposes are more important, and they can override these other activity or the ends of other things because they're less important. Um, now, again, I think it's very important just because Aquinas uses language that sounds like Bacon doesn't mean it means it like Bacon. Francis Bacon. Um, remember, so if you think of that second characteristic of divine artistry, <coughs> God creates with attention to the good of a whole. And that means that every creature, again, has those two ends, the primary end and the secondary end, to fulfill the good of the whole. So again, the antelope has the primary end of living the antelope life well, but the secondary end of promoting the flourishing of other creatures in its ecosystem. So non-human, this is, I think, important to understand in the system, uh, Aquinas' system. So non-human creatures are not just ordered toward human beings, they're also ordered toward each other in this kind of complex network of relationships. Um, and so I think what we should, in, uh, when we read Aquinas' statement that all creatures are ordered toward human good for use, it should be interpreted as part of this broader doctrine of each thing having a primary and a secondary end. And we can summarize the view as, as follows. We have all the pieces in place. In fact, we just need to sort of pull them from the things we've seen. So first of all, human beings are, have creative artistry as part of their flourishing. And the flourishing of human beings is an integral part of the good of the whole. Right? So it's something that perfects the universe by being there, just as the lion and the antelope do. The lion and the antelope do. Now, in order to exercise creativity, I need to be able to use products in the world around me, um, just as the lion needs the antelope in order to survive. And although Aquinas holds that human flourishing has a special nobility because it consists naturally in the contemplation of truth and supernaturally in a communion with the triune God, um, nonetheless, I think that's not his reasoning here. His reasoning is instead that the intellectual creature is the only kind of creature for which every other creature can have, can, it's the only other creature that can be a secondary end for all other creatures. And the reason he gives is here. <coughs> he says in the Summa Theologiae, because the intellectual soul can comprehend universals, so have abstract concepts, its power relates to the infinite. Therefore, it is not naturally limited to determinate ideas or means. So the human being naturally has reason and his or her hands, which are the organs of organs, since the human being can use them to make for himself or herself an infinite variety of instruments to produce an infinite number of effects. And so we see that the, the what artistry consists in is the ability to see a possible use for anything at all, 
The lion can only use, a, for its own flourishing, a limited number of beings. There's vast swaths of reality that are not, in fact, helpful to the lion and cannot be used by it for its own flourishing. But for the human being, because of the kind of ingenuity that's given as part of the intellect, any one of the things we find around us, we can find some sort of use for. Right? And I think that's what Aquinas has in mind when he says that all creatures are ordered toward human beings as their end. He means it as their secondary end because we could use all of them. Um, okay, so I don't think we need to see anything particularly threatening to the dignity of non-human creatures in this picture. Um, and Aquinas is certainly not letting humans off the hook. As images of the divine artist, we can operate within the parameters of the divine art project alone and just as he allows for an improving nature only in the limited sense of ministering to nature, so too he allows for using nature, I think, only in the limited sense of for the sake of the good of the whole of which human artistry is a part. So that's the justification of the possibility of our using things, is that human artistry is in fact a good facet to have in a complete universe, but it then has to be exercised as a part of that complete whole, right, in, in view of the goodness of the whole, and not in isolation from the whole. <coughs> okay, and again, you can think of gardening as a good example. The gardener can't just let one plant, it's this really beautiful plant, but he can't let it just take over the entire garden, right? The goodness and order of the garden require a variety of plants, and some of the plants that you might like a lot have to nonetheless be held in check so they don't take everything over. So just because human artistry is a good, that doesn't mean we can just sort of justify pursuing it at the expense of all goods you know, uh, without any other consideration. <coughs> okay, so let me conclude then. Oh, there's the chicken with its primary end and secondary end. Okay. Back to it. Yes. All right. Um, so to try to, try, try to extract some practical implications from all of this, of course, Aquinas doesn't offer us a kind of rubric that we can just put into a little machine and turn the crank and come up with an answer as to whether we should build a hospital here or a shopping mall over there, right? Um, but I think we use this as a kind of set of principles or goals that we can strive for in discerning our responsibility toward the environment. And each of these principles, I think, places an ethical limit of some sort on our actions. So the first principle has to do with respect for other creatures as having intrinsic natural ends. So when we're practicing medicine or breeding show roses or, um, or chickens or milk cows or something, we should do it in a way that cooperates with their natures to help them be more fully what they are and not by manipulating them into some stunted version of themselves that delivers a product we prefer. And second is authenticity. I think this is important for Aquinas. Human flourishing is something that's objective and real about the human being, and it's not just something that we can make up as we go along. Right? And so if human flourishing is an important part of the good of the whole, and therefore the use of things for the sake of human flourishing as a kind of secondary end is justified, um, they can only be justified if the use is for true human flourishing. Right? And so it's a, we could think of an interesting contrast here. We might say, if we use a biblical example, right, that there would be a justification for the father of the prodigal son to kill the fatty calf to celebrate the family reunited. Right? Um, but if to break just one branch off of a tree to strike someone in the heat of argument right, would be a violation of the end of the tree. So where we might say there's a kind of completion of the secondary end of a thing, in fulfilling a true aspect of human flourishing, um, any, as, any activity that serves uh, greed, greedy or selfish or violent purposes um, that are not part of genuine human flourishing is in fact a violence and a violation of the natural end of other things. The third idea, <coughs> I think, is a kind of expanded outlook that Aquinas might recommend to us. Um, as part of the whole, so we have a responsibility to pay attention to how our artistic aspects fit into a broader picture and not simply say, oh, well, you know, this is a good thing and so we can ignore all the other 
ways in which it's tied in to a larger system. And then lastly, the principle of humility, uh, which is violated when we forget that the image is not the original. So the things, the exercise of our activity can't be a usurping of the activity that God has in giving being to creatures, right? But it can only ever be a kind of cooperation with the ongoing divine activity that begins with the act of creation. Um, and that occurs, I think that holds true just as much for this sort of cooperative ministering to nature as well as using, right? Because again, we have to be careful of we were operating within the parameters of someone else's art project, right, if you think about it as a whole. All right. So at the end of the day, in some sense, Aquinas, I think, would disagree that art perfects nature. If what we mean by that is that natural beings start out in an imperfect state and it's up to us to make them better, right? But what he might agree with is if we construe art perfects nature, to mean that we have a kind, that the exercise of our, act, our human uh, artistry is a kind of thing that is a perfective part of the organic whole that is the natural world. And so if there's any sense in which God has left the universe unfinished, is that he sort of left a place in it for our creative activity that completes it in some way, just by the presence of that activity. Mozart symphonies and people sitting around a campfire and well-constructed cities for the sake of the common good. And these are things that, are, that add to the goodness and beauty of the whole. Um, so the divine model, I think, also shows us what it means to be creative in an ethical way, <coughs> as we see here in this image. And in order to be up to this challenge, I think we need to cultivate an eye for beauty, an eye specifically for beauty. And there's a kind of appreciation that God has in his creation that um, is a key aspect, I think, also in human artistry. So perhaps a fitting way to end would be to go back to the beginning, to the garden. And what I suggest is that the Thomistic vision of environmental justice can be construed as a kind of, a certain kind of gardening not the gardening of the super scientist in Bacon's paradise, right? But the kind of gardening that's exercised um, by the original gardeners who are the, both in some sense the adornment and the caretakers of the first garden. So the, in, in Genesis we read then that the Lord God formed a human being from the mud of the earth and breathed into his face the breath of life and he became a living soul. But the Lord God had planted a garden of pleasure from the beginning in which he placed the human whom he had formed. Therefore the Lord God took the human and put him in the garden of pleasure in order that he might work in it, and the Latin here is operare, following the version of Aquinas, but it comes in any way. Um, and perhaps we can think of this working in it as bringing the element of creativity, right, that adorns it, rounds out its goodness. I might work in it and look after it, custodirect, with this aspect of service or ministry to nature. Um, is it in any accident, I think, that the writers of Genesis describe God's act of creating the world for humans as the act of planting a garden in the very same ground from which the human being is themselves taken? Thank you. Um, one or two questions. Um, one is uh, sort of conceptual and intrinsic to what you presented as Aquinas' argument. The other is more uh, concerned with how this kind of argument could conceivably be presented to your average modern secular scientist who, in fact, would likely look askance or uh, scoff at uh, the distinction between uh, divine and human creativity yeah. uh, and any suggestion that 
human creativity is, is constrained uh, in ways that divine creativity is not. Um, but let's start with the first one. One of the things that um, you mentioned was this uh, notion toward the end in your third slide before the end of flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a term that um, I certainly admit to using with some regularity myself, yeah. but I, I do often wonder exactly whether it's possible for us to have a shared understanding of what it means, mm -hmm. unless we are already in a way committed to a sort of Aristotelian notion of entelech higher. Yeah. Um, uh, what, uh, after all, uh, one of the things that's missing, and we do after all know how this goes, is that things don't go very well in the garden. Sin will soon occur. And so part of, of the human beings uh, is that they, in fact, can misapprehend their capacity for flourishing and misdirect their capacity for intervening in nature um, and indeed promptly do so. Uh, is, is the moment of sin... Uh, and so here the question for me is, um, isn't Aqu I mean, what I see sort of missing from Aquinas' mm -hmm. account and what you have given us, I think, is a very fair rendition of it, um, is the Augustinian, the darker mm -hmm. element, uh, in which uh, part of human flourishing uh, involves also consistently getting it wrong, uh, the very notion of flourishing. That flourishing is not, yeah. in fact, uh, sort of a univocal concept, but that implicit in is actually always the, uh, not just the likelihood, but the all virtual certainty that we will misapprehend our capabilities, will misdirect them, and, and therefore in some way um, sort of stray beyond this rather tidier picture that yeah. the Yes, yes, thank you for that. The, the very interesting questions to interrogate Aquinas with, I think. Um, and. So regarding the, the first point, which was your sec the second thing that you said, um, I think perhaps, perhaps uh, there, there's a kind of ambiguity in the term flourishing. And the way I'm using it here, in terms of kind of teleological perfection, which of course to Aquinas is used the term the good of something, something's natural good or end, um, is conceived of certainly as something that can be fallen, it's an ideal, from which we constantly fall short, right? So it's set up as a kind of standard that's implicit within a nature that it's supposed to live up to. But he certainly doesn't think that we do live up to it, and particularly human beings fall short continually in their living up to the standard of their flourishing. Um, so, so I think Aquinas might, given that usage of the term, he might resist the notion um, that flourishing would include falling short, right? The, the falling short is precisely a divergence from the ideal we ought to be leading, right? Now, there's certainly an expectation or realization that in a fallen world, that this is an ordinary part of human life, but it's precisely a failure to flourish. Um, so that, that sort of provides us with this, with this difficulty then of how we handle the problem of human beings um, how human beings can actually even apply these principles, these are sort of standards to live up to, but how can we live up to them given that we fall short so often, right? And perhaps that, perhaps some of that work is supposed to be done by the fourth principle, right? Is we sort of, which was humility, right? Um, because it seems to be in, in the sort of the standard of the of the sort of Christian theological reflection is to think of um, the first fall, particularly in the language of pride, wanting to be like God in some sense, right? Um, and so you can think of that here, too, as the way in which we can fall short in our environmental responsibilities is in sort of overestimating the kind of control and knowledge that we have, sort of assuming that we can, in fact, control things or figure out what's the best for them and what's the best for us in this sort of light of perfect reason. Um, and that's something that I think Aquinas thinks we certainly can't do and um, are always going to be falling short from, and that's precisely why we have to be very cautious I think, in exercising these kinds of activities. So I think humility is supposed to fulfill that function. Yes. 
So what would you say to the sort of, you know, um, hard-nosed naturalist who would say there is no hole, there is no source, there is right. only stuff, and it's placed in our purview so that we may use it. Uh, and if it doesn't fit our purposes, we'll remake it. Uh, and if the pig is capable of growing hard valves that we can use, then we'll make sure it grows precisely so that we can then extract them, which will be the end of the pig, um, and we'll grow the pig solely for that purpose. Um, and so there's no sense of accountability. So you, you know the model obviously well. The question is, how do we reason with someone who doesn't accept any of the framing terms uh, that drive the entire inquiry yeah. of Aquinas. Yeah, I mean, the sticking point here is precisely the notion of natures as something that are objective to things. That there is such a thing as being a chicken, that that's real and not something that we simply bring to the table or name or group similar objects together, right? That there's a kind of integrity in reality there to being a chicken. I think that's the sticking point precisely for between the, the Thomistic view and the naturalist view that you're describing. Right? And it's very be, because it's such a fundamental notion, I think it's very hard to sort of uh, to justify it argumentatively by finding something else that it rests upon. And I think the only strategy that one can take in these cases is um, what one does in the case of first principles is is to find ways of pointing and drawing attention. And I think there it can be helpful to think about um, when, we, when we talk about uh, the being of a chicken, right? There's uh, some, someone who's absolutely committed to this position, I think, would just bite the bullet on all of this. But I think there's a lot of people who are sort of torn between the two and not, not quite sure where to think. And, um, in, in, in sort of indicating the existence of nature's one one possible strategy is to point out that if, if there isn't something that real that is to be chicken-ish, right, then there isn't really anything that chickens have in common that would make them be more like each other than this and this chair, right? And there's something fundamentally unintuitive about that view. You want to say that they have some closer kinship than the chicken does with the chair, and then human rights is another important issue in relation to this, right? It's very hard to justify any sort of universal principle of moral action where we say it is absolutely wrong to treat people in this unegalitarian way or to torture because it's a fundamental dictum of, of human nature that it is wrong to treat somebody like this, right? We can't do that if you don't have some sort of notion of a shared being, right? So those are two strategies I think we can use that are not you know, foolproof, but they're a start to a conversation. Yes. Um, to follow up, Augustine, I realize the paper is about Thomas Aquinas, but I'm just wondering, with this sort of view of how humans are supposed to think about you know, using other creatures or other parts of creation, is it possible maybe to map on or to constructively use or bring into this discussion Augustine's sense of use and enjoyment, that all creations must be used to enjoy God? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, my... Oh, I sort of 10,000 foot characterization of Yeah, the I realize that's one of the yeah. things that it's a big topic for me, but it just seems to fit. Yeah, really it's, per perhaps the difference is that, and, and I, I, I'm reluctant to say this is a difference because I think there's probably passages in Augustine that one could bring out to resist this kind of interpretation. We're, we're looking very broadly at sort of conceptual tendencies. You can say that Aquinas tends more strongly to emphasize that things have a good in themselves and that they are ends in themselves, right? And then secondarily ordered towards human beings and towards each other. Um, whereas Augustine tends to emphasize more that everything is ordered towards the creator as its final end. Now that's not to say that that's not present in, Aqu in Aquinas. It's certainly absolutely central to his theology and metaphysics. And in fact, when he talks about how things are ordered to human beings, another reason that he gives for this is that human beings are the image of the creator, and all things are ordered toward the creator. So you can see a kind of way station, right? And the idea here, again, is that human beings are able to use all things for salvation, right? Um, 
So the elements of both positions, I think, are in both thinkers, but you do see, I think, in Augustine, a much stronger streamlining of the teleology of all creation toward God as the final end. Certainly in the confession. Well, I'm just thinking of in De Doctrine and Christiana, yeah. he even does talk about yeah. using persons to enjoy God at the right. same time that he wouldn't, he would still say that, you know, persons are, you know, have goods in themselves. Right. Well, I wonder, too, about... Yeah, and when he talks like this, I'm not sure that it even maps perfectly onto this language of means and ends that shows up in Aquinas. Um, so even when he talks about using humans for their friends or relatives, for their relationships, for the sake of God, right, that rings really horribly because you're thinking, you know, haunt, you, know, you don't use a person as a means to an end. And I don't think that's quite where Augustine's mind is there. It seems to me that what he wants to say is that in all of our relationships, if we're not pursuing those relationships ordered toward God as final end in the sense of in view of fulfilling the divine plan of salvation, right, then in some way we're mis that's the misusing of the human being, right? So we might think, well, the use of, of the relationship is a kind of aberration. Right, but he sees it as actually the way to fulfill the relationship and to give it integrity. Right, and that, that kind of language, I think, is or that kind of imagery is not present in this, this discussion. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, thank you again. I was wondering, you, you, when you present these principles, I think you're going to have things which limit human license or something that have negative principles. Yeah. I wonder if there's a book more scope than what you said, or positive principles that inspire virtuous environmental action. And whether that might actually rhetorically be useful in talking to this industrialist scientist who doesn't want to hear this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so the two things perhaps that are positive that open up positive space for human activity, right? Well the the, the naturalist is not going to agree because you know, there's the, the notion of things as having their kind of dignity and integrity, right? And so we can in fact through our through our limited knowledge attempt to support things in their in the fulfillment of their nature, right? Um, and that's a positive aspect. Uh, but the other one, I think, is that um, Aquinas really gives us a vision of human artistic endeavors as something that is that fills a kind of space in the created order. And it's very different from some uh, from some, so for instance, um, Arne Ness, the, in the deep ecology movement, speaks of he, he talks about human beings as having overstepped in the sense that we're doing all sorts of things, we're performing all sorts of activities they don't need to do in order to survive, right? And this is an overreach of human activity and is destructive, and we ought to go back, reduce back to the level that everything else is operating in the ecosystem at, which is simply survival, right? So some kind of hunter-gatherer life, very minimalist hunter-gatherer life stuff. And I think for Aquinas, that would be that's taking away from the human being something that's actually very important to human flourishing, just as important to human flourishing as you know, water or habitat is to a non-human animal, or to us, right? Um, and so there, there's, the, he, I think he makes a positive space for that as well. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of a two-part question, but um, first of all, thank you. Um, thinking about sort of, it seems that that um, uh, sort of Thomas here requires a certain clarity about what is nature, what is sort of human. Um, you know, like with a chicken, there's something to it about that. I'm talking about like a gut bacteria or something like weather. And so I wanted maybe to see what what you think this might have to do with thinking about something like climate change, where yeah. how do we think about primary and secondary um, uh, telos for, for something like climate? Um, because in a sense, it almost seems like, I just ran through real quick, yeah. in my own head, sort of, you could think that, um, you could use this kind of argument to say that you know, humans might want to you know, seed the clouds with chemicals to you know, mess with the climate in order to, to sort of improve, whatever, you know what I mean? Um, and which is certainly one of the live questions we yeah. have to change the responses. It's just more technology. Yeah. Um, 
So anyway, I just wondered, you know, from kind of the, 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 the lowest levels of sort of the, what's human, what's nature, how do we think about manipulation, things like a, like a microbiome or that, mm -hmm. up to the largest spheres of nature. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it, it's, it's very interesting we put it in, in connection with climate particularly being something that has to do with the whole. Right, so it's, you're not talking about some specific species, but a kind of condition that affects the flourishing of the entire network, right? Um, and there, I think, it, it, this, this sort of ethical approach is actually extremely frustrating in many ways, because it doesn't, it doesn't provide a kind of rubric that we can apply to say, here's how I can exclude this particular action, or here's how I can definitively justify this particular action. All, all you can really get out of this, I think, is kind of goals or standards that you try to hold yourself to. In this particular case, you can think about, well, what are, what are the kind of standards that one might try to hold oneself to? Like, in connection with this notion of humility, it's extremely important. We, we have this idea, we, we can fix this problem by putting in this fix, right? And we're pretty sure it will fix the problem, but we tend to underestimate the possible ripple effects of that activity, right? because they're not known, and so they seem unimportant, which is precisely we get ourselves into these messes in the worst place, right? Um, and so perhaps one of the things that Aquinas might counsel us to do is to sort of dial back on the kind of optimism that we have that a fix will just be an easy way to solve a problem, right? Or that we'll be able to minimize the kind of effects of these activities. So in a sense, this principle gives us a kind of reason for restraint in saying we can simply correct for this problem without having to worry too much about the possible side effects, right? And you see this, we see this in medicine in particular, right? Um, and in the uses of medical technology, like, well, you can, you can fix those problems when they come up down the road, right? But we don't have to really think about them now. So, I, I don't think that's probably not very satisfying. It would be a kind of thing to live up that you might, might suggest that we sort of constantly have in the back of our minds. I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Okay. I don't know who is moving out to possibly get. Uh, so my question is uh, related to uh, human, uh, I guess, collective uh, human amnesia and, uh, and, and human ignorance. I think both in the environmental and So in this, it seems like, how, like, what is our capacity to know what the good of the whole is? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, I guess, a practical example of this is, what about those creatures which are the product of um, violent creation? So, um, human creation, so um, killer bees, for example, you know, trying to make uh, honeybees that produce more. Once they exist. Yeah, once they yeah. exist. Interesting. Yeah. Um, it's tricky. So okay, so this is this is tricky because I think it's it's hard to see where Aquinas particularly would go in this in this respect. Because I think it didn't occur to him that such radically new traits could be developed in a particular species, right? Um, such that we would then have to deal with that problem, but now it's a species that's there, right, in some sense. Um, the chicken is a good example, too. I mean, the yeah. modern Cornish cross is right. nothing like its original. Right. Uh, and yeah. So it may be, like, what is the teleological yeah. end of, of chickens that were supposed to be in the jungle, but now brought out into the right. prairie? And so, so maybe you can see something like this. So, one of the things that, that sort of in the back of my mind when I think about Aquinas and nature is, is we, ha we tend to have this notion of species that's very narrow, right, biologically. And I think for Aquinas, this notion is very, very broad. And so when we talk about you know, chicken as like a particular species, right, he might see this much more as a kind of range of perfection, right, 
that a thing along a kind of spectrum can have, right, in some way that's, fun that's unified in, in some fundamental way, but still is susceptible of a kind of range. Right? So we might not say that we've developed a new species in any of these cases, but we've simply accentuated or drawn out ways that this species can be that it would not have been able to sort of express without some kind of human intervention. You might think of it that way. And in that case, then that gives us a reason to think of those species as well as having the kind of teleology that they have before even we, uh, we meddle with them, right? Um, the, the other thing here is that he's also relatively pessimistic about the degree of knowledge, of the degree of understanding that we can have of another nature, right? And this is why I keep coming back to this humility principle, right? Because we might think we can just sort of sit down and map out what's good for a chicken. And now we certainly can take out certain things. We can recognize, if somebody's very familiar with chickens, you can recognize when a chicken is doing well and when it seems to be really doing poorly, right? We can differentiate those two things, but it's very hard for us to sort of, beyond that general assessment, to be able to say this absolutely specific activity is something that teleologically perspective, perspective of the chicken, when it scratches the dirt in this particular way, that seems to be beyond what we can actually fathom. It may even be beyond what we can manage for understanding our own humanity for Aquinas. I mean, we have more insight because we're able to reflect on our actions from inside. But still, there's a kind of opacity that nature has, right? which is why I keep coming back to this. Do we have time for a yeah, last question? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, you spoke about whether um, a creature fulfills its secondary end in terms of whether it serves humanity's true end, and like the way we use it for violent purposes yeah. did not, you know, its secondary end was violated. Yeah. Um, so in some way, this gets referred back to the, the true end and the goodness and dignity of man. Mm -hmm. Then if, if his dignity is primarily So here I am simply focusing on cre the creative aspect of what is distinctive of human beings. Um, but for Aquinas, the creative aspect is a sort of, it's a subset of our intellectual nature as a whole. And so to fulfill our flourishing, it was the rational animals, right? So our flourishing is animalistic in some sense, right? It's animalistic in an intellectual way. Right? So we satisfy our animal desires in a way that makes sense. And that's sort of the, the broad picture of the makes sense according to of, of the rule of reason. Right? And that's the, the broad picture of how to construe moral human flourishing. Right? Um, and so simply saying, ah, creative art, artistry, that's a good thing to have. And so I invented something, and so that must make it good because our artistry is good. Right? We want to say, well, we have to put this into the broader perspective also of what's good in human action, right? And so avoiding the vices that corrupt human nature and um, strengthening the virtues that constitute human flourishing, that's all part of the picture of how we should be artistic in some kind of ethical way. I don't know, does that, does that help? Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's probably a bigger 
image of God that we have is different, for instance, the kind of image that an angel would have. An angel is just nothing but an intellect. And so it's not like the rest of the embodied aspect is, you know, not really imaging, but just the intellect part, right? For him, the whole thing is our unique manner of expressing the image of God in an intellectually embodied way. All right, if everyone will just join me in thanking Dr. Kuhn.